Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. Joe spoke with Melissa Hartwig Urban. She tells an incredibly personal, powerful story that's going to help you reshape the way that you see and use traumatic things in your life. But that's not even what the interview is about. The interview is about Whole30. Many years ago, I was a CrossFit trainer, and Whole30 was a big, big thing. Mm-hmm. So it's really cool to meet the person behind this, to hear how powerful it is, to hear from the person who invented it, how to apply it to your life. So uh, I'm really excited about this interview. I'm with some people I'm also really excited about. I'm with Dr. L. That's me. Fine, doctor. Doctor, not Dr. Doctor. Shapra. <laughs> One day I Seed will Huntress. be. Yeah. And our retired Colonel Tim Nye. And I'm very excited to be here as well. Awesome. And we've got Marion, our producer, up the volume. who keeps us on track and finds these great interviews for us. Um, you know what? Stick around for the end of the interview as well, because what we're going to do, uh, we're going to go to Joe. He's going to do this interview. And at the end, we're going to come back and talk about what we got from it. Four different uh, perspectives, um, uh, just to really leverage our, all of our experiences and, um, and share it with our viewers. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by True Form Runner. Conquer your next race with a complete training solution from Spartan and True Form. The Spartan True Form Trainer will redefine your running, improve your form, and reduce injury. Save 10% with the code SPARTAN10 at trueformrunner.com slash spartan. That's trueformrunner.com slash spartan. We are here in Calamigos Ranch, where actually where Spartan uh, used to have a race years ago. Really? Yeah. Yep, for Spartan Up Podcast with uh, Melissa Hartwig Urban, founder of Whole30. That's right. And basically, you had a really easy upbringing, like everything went perfectly. <laughs> it did for a while. Like two parents stayed at home. Um, I was really good in school. I was not a troublemaking kid. And then it all kind of... In New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, yeah. Like really super vanilla. And then it all kind of went to hell in a handbasket in college. Bro- brothers, sisters? I had a younger sister, two and a half years younger. We were like appropriately bickering and then became best friends. Mom mm-hmm. stayed home with us. Parents were married up until I was in college. It was all very, you Skiing? know. Skiing? Did you ski? Uh, we didn't ski a ton. Took a lot of road trips as a family. You know, did a lot of outdoor, like beach, a lot of Hampton Beach. On Hampton Beach. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a lot of like lakes, and we had a boat on Winnipesaukee. So. So that's the perfect setting. How, what, yeah. Like, so I'm a parent now. I've got four kids. Yeah. And and like, for those parents out there, listen. What happened? It's a, it's kind of sucky, but pretty common, unfortunately, sexual abuse when I was 16. And the trauma, you know, at that age, it was, I was so impressionable. It was my first experience. Like it was, I I didn't handle it well. I didn't tell anyone for a while. And then when I told my family, they didn't handle it well. And they did the best they could. But like, as a parent, I can't imagine having to navigate the situation. And, And it was someone in my family. So that was like a, it put them in a very difficult position. And So that was really kind of the start of like the devolution of Melissa. It was like me not being able to process and handle this trauma and feeling like I wasn't super supported by my family. Well, which happens a lot. I mean, you see it in the press now, right? Like, Yeah. I can't even imagine knowing something happens and no one else kind of believing it. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people always say like, well, why wouldn't you come forward? And why didn't you say anything about it? Like for so many reasons, you know, my even my family members kind of put it back on me. Um, they just certainly didn't believe me at first. It made things incredibly awkward. It was very, I was very ashamed and, and no one kind of told me that it wasn't my fault and, and I could move forward with it. So there were just so many reasons. And then my family didn't want to talk about it, you know, big Catholic Portuguese family. Like sure. if you don't talk about it, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So I kind of ate it like for a long time. And, and then, um, what does that lead to? Well, and then it led to me finding drugs. So, you know, once I found drugs at, at, 16, that, at 16, or? no, it took me a couple years. I tried drinking alcohol that didn't work. I tried, you know, kind of, uh, like really my relationship with food maybe became strained, but that was never the path I took when I f- first like smoked my first joint. I was like, Oh, this is what I've been looking for to kind of take me away. So when I was in college, that really led to a five year period of like pretty serious drug abuse. Wow. And, yeah. then, and then how do you how do you come out of that? Because a lot of people just downward spiral to yep. to the end. Right? I got really lucky. You know, um, not every addict has a bottom, but I certainly did have a bottom. I was, uh, you know, I lost my job. I lost my family and friends. I was about to be evicted from my apartment. But I had did a, you finish college though through that. whole. No. Oh, no. I had to drop out of school okay. because I was using um, I was very functional as an addict for a very long time, which is how I was able to get away for for almost five years. But, you know, I realized at some point that I was either going to like there was one moment where I was either going to like die or, or go to rehab. And I had a boyfriend who really cared and pressured me into going to rehab. 
and I got clean for the first time. And then relapsed after how, how a old, year. How old were you then? Uh, I think I was 24. 24, okay. I think. Yeah. Gosh, I have to do the math. Yeah. Uh, and then I relapsed after a year of being clean. And when I relapsed, I was able to self-arrest after just a few weeks. And I was how, like, how does okay. that? How does a relapse happen? How does... <sighs> I don't know. I found myself... I think how it happens is that, first of all, the only thing I changed about my life in that first period was I stopped doing drugs. I didn't change anything else. So it was really like I had no margin for error. And then you tell yourself this story that like, well, I'm doing better now and I can handle it better. And and you tend to romanticize the fun parts about using and you kind of forget about the bad parts and you feel like you have your feet underneath you and you relax your, I relaxed my guard. And I just found myself at a party like, hi, I don't even know what I took one night. And, but I self-arrested and I was like, this is not the path I want to go down. I know, you know, I picked up right where I left off, which was a very dangerous place. I checked myself back into an outpatient facility and in 2000, on, on your own, went, nobody, nobody, on my own. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty rare. Probably. Yeah. Probably. But I'm very like black or white on or off. Yeah. Uh, I'm very good at sort of upholding my inner expectations. And I knew that something really bad was going to happen. If how I was your, um, how was your mom and dad family at that? Your sister, like, how were they feeling through that whole My parents didn't like my parents didn't know, like I had to call my mom from rehab and say like, mom, I'm in rehab for drug abuse. And like her husband, her newer husband at the time was like, yeah, of course you are. Like you've been a mess for a long time. And my mom was like shocked. I mean, again, she had no experience with this sort of thing. They were very confused, but very supportive. Um, uh, But we still really like, especially my my mom, I still haven't really talked about it with her. Yeah, not yet. I don't know what I would do. You know, I, I think, I mean, it just happens to anybody, right? So, like, it it's not like, you can be a great parent. Yes. You can be doing everything right. Yes. And then, yeah. You know, and I think especially in the, in a case of, like, abuse or some kind of trauma, it, it, unless you've got somebody who's really well-versed in, like, getting it out into the open and getting you into counseling and being willing to talk about it, like, that just wasn't what my family was set up for. Which not everybody accepts, right? Because because it's frowned upon a little bit. Like, oh, there must be something wrong with that person if they need counseling. Or oh, I mean, look, I'm a huge fan of therapy. I have yeah. done so many, so much therapy in so many modalities, and I really like. I talk about this so openly because I want to take the stigma away. Yeah. Um, there's no shame. There's no like your self worth is not wrapped up in your addiction. There's no shame in needing medication to help. There's no shame in seeking therapy like these are all these all need to be normalized sure because they're good healthy processes so you so you come out of rehab the second time yeah. you self-arrested yeah and now what uh, now you're 24 at it's this 2000 yeah. and, and and i get clean for the last time so i'm coming up on my 19 year anniversary wow. Congrats. thank you that is awesome but it was at that moment that i realized if i was going to stay clean i had to change everything about my life like everything i changed my friends i changed the music i listened to i changed my clothes i moved i got a new job i started exercising i started paying attention to what i ate like that's where my sort of um passion for fitness and health came from you think um cuz cuz we have a lot of people through the spartan system around the globe yeah. and um not because this is unique to spartan i just think it's unique to the world there's lots of addictions going Mm -hmm. on yeah and so i hear the stories a lot and they're like i just took my unhealthy addiction yeah and made it a healthy addiction so was exercise when you just described all those things changing clothes changing friends moving was that the big biggest one you think i think exercise was a really big one in that it made me like i would go to the gym and even though i had no idea what i was doing and i was like fresh out of rehab Nobody at the gym knew that. They just knew I was someone else at the gym getting on a treadmill. And that really helped me. It was, at the time, I was adopting a growth mindset. I didn't know what it was called. Sure. And I, I do think my behavior with exercise was unhealthy in the beginning, but I wasn't worried about that. And over time, it very naturally transitioned into like a healthy pursuit. I'm not, I'm not addicted to exercise. If I can't go to the gym, I don't flip about, out. Like. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have a really healthy relationship so with I'll, exercise I'll, You'll now. have to recommend some therapists for me because yeah. I'm, I'm addicted. <laughs> yeah. I got some issues. Yeah, I think a lot of people do. And I think, you know, you can use that colloquial term like addicted in a really good way, but it can also be like damaging where like if you can't go to the gym, does it affect your self-worth? Does it affect your self-confidence? Does it affect the way you look at yourself, you Ru- know, and see yourself in the mirror? Yeah. My day. yeah. I just don't feel good. It's kind of like, it's psychosomatic, right? Because if I wash my car, yeah. It drives better, <laughs> which can't yeah. be. Right? But, so I, I just know, feel better. I, I, don't, I don't know why. Our relationship with like exercise and food and our bodies is just very complicated. It's it is. complicated. 
Why don't you and I take a break? Why don't we go for a swim? Want to go? I like that. It's yeah, we'll do the swim. We'll do like a three or four mile swim. Perfect. And then come back. And I want to talk about you started a business. Yeah. And you wrote a book. I did. I wrote a couple. A couple books. All right, cool. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go swim. We will be right back to this episode. But first, we're going to talk about our sponsor, Trueform. And um, Johnny, do you remember last year at World Championships when those four intrepid athletes um, decided to lock themselves in a shipping container for 24 hours on one of these? Yeah, not just lock themselves in a shipping container. Lock themselves in a shipping container and see who could run the furthest on a treadmill. <laughs> Sounds completely nuts. We love Spartan, it. Spartan, we're completely nuts. Fortunately, there's also a company out there that's equally committed to doing the work. And it's Trueform Treadmills. Way to go, Trueform. Yeah, no, honestly. Yeah, what, it's a beautiful marriage. An incredible partnership. So what we did, we locked these four guys in Whenever a dark, marriages. silent space. They ran on a true form treadmill. And you know the cool thing about this? They did the work. So a normal treadmill, it starts to spin. You just try and keep up with it. It does all the work for you. And if you run badly, you just run badly faster. True form, you have to make it move. You do the work. It makes you do the work properly. That's the other thing. It makes you run better. People think that practice makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. True. Imperfect practice makes injury. So Trueform has put together a program that's going to solve all that for you. Save 10% with the code SPARTAN10 at trueformrunner.com slash SPARTAN. That's trueformrunner.com slash SPARTAN. All right, let's run back to this episode, Johnny. Good call, Sephra. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we are back. What I'm amazed at is you're able to swim yeah. and not even get your yeah. hair wet. My hair is kind of magical. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> We've got to teach that. If we... If, yeah. Talk about that and not the other stuff. Okay. But, but um, when do you write a book? You're 24. You come out. You change your clothes. You change your life. You move. Now what? Yeah. So I got really into CrossFit. I okay. started. I got my RKC kettlebell certification. I started traveling for CrossFit kettlebell certs so this teaching. Is, this is 2000. This is all like between two, like around 2006 is when got I it. got really okay. into that. Yep. And then in 2009. Uh, in Utah. You're in Utah now. Uh, no, I'm still back in Boston. Oh, you're in I'm at CrossFit Boston doing oh. a really tough Olympic lifting session. We had just gone to a nutrition seminar put on by a friend of ours, Rob Wolf, okay. who was talking about inflammatory factors of food and how removing these may lead to like better performance and quality of life and, and, and weight loss and stuff. So anyway, my original co-founder, we, we were just kind of sitting around and he was like, well, hang on. We don't even know. Oh, you're just sitting around with this person. Yeah, we're Got just sitting it. around. Right. And he's like, I wonder if we did this like super squeaky clean 30 day dietary experiment. Like, I wonder what would happen. And I'm eating thin. You mints. and this person. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Thin mints right out of the sleeve because right. I just exercised and right. I deserve them. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. I would love to try this. Like, when should we start? And he was like, right now. And, you know, the things that made me a good addict make me very, very good at habit change. So I put the Thin Mints down and I was like, you're on. And that was the start of the very first Whole30 in April 2009. This like self-experiment, wondering if I could improve athletic performance and recovery. In 30 days. Yeah. So you guys came up with the challenge of sitting around eating Thin Mints. Yep. And it was, um, could we hold ourselves accountable? Yes. I'm making this up for yes. 30 days. Yes. And... What would happen? Yeah, it was like cleaning up that last 20% of your diet, right? Because we're both like, man, we eat really well. Yeah. But there's like 20% of stuff sprinkled in here and there. What if we strip that out and like really went, you know, Just stripped. for 30 days. So it was yeah, a, it was yeah. attainable. If yeah. you said to yourself, it's going to be forever. Exactly. You might be scared. Exactly. But, but, and, and when you were coming up with the idea, were you thinking about exercise too or just food? I was thinking, no, just about food. It was just about the food. But all right. I cared about was whether it improved my recovery from exercise or my performance. I didn't have weight to lose. I was like already the healthy person at my office. I didn't feel like I had, I didn't feel like I had an unhealthy relationship with food because I had never thought about my relationship with food. Sure. So it was just like, okay, cool. Let's see if I can do better in the gym. But what ended up happening in those 30 days is that it showed me all of the ways that I was using food. Like I used to use drugs, like reward, punishment, right. relieve anxiety, self-comfort, self-soothing. Because you finished that CrossFit workout and you wanted the, the thin mints. Exactly. Right? Yep. And it was like kind of the final physical piece that clicked for me in terms of my recovery is, okay, so you're not using drugs anymore, but you're kind of using food to numb your feelings and self-soothe. Now you don't have those foods that you were using. Sure. What else can you do? Sure. And it taught me how to open up and talk to another human being and to like self-care without food or alcohol and because because after the workout, you don't have the Thin Mints, and yeah. so you're for looking for something else yeah. to do. Let me go yeah. talk to somebody. I had a really hard time. Like, well, right. I'm having a hard day. What should I do? And I was like, right. well, you could pick up the phone and call your sister. You could go for a walk. You right. could read a book. You, you could, could cook yourself a really healthy meal. Right. But it wasn't eat the cookies. 
And so after 30 days, what happens? Uh, my energy was up. My sleep was better. My mood was way happier. Like I was so much nicer at work to people in the office. My athletic performance improved. My recovery improved. I leaned out a little bit. But like the biggest piece for me is that in those 30 days, I had a healthier relationship with my body and the food than I had ever had. It was supremely but how, transformational. How do you know it wasn't like I described where, you know, I clean the car and the car drives better. How do you know it wasn't psychosomatic that... Well, in part, I mean, first of all, it might have been in part. Like right. when you're taking really good care of yourself, I knew I was nourishing myself really well. I had made a commitment to myself that I had followed through on. Obviously, yeah. that's going to lead to an improvement in self-confidence and mood and self-esteem and self-efficacy. That's awesome. Sure. I won't discount that. But like the energy, the no more 2 p.m. head on desk where I needed a pick-me-up of sugar and coffee was huge. Um, the sleeping better, that's pretty quantifiable. I was falling asleep. I was staying asleep. I was waking up refreshed without an alarm. Like those were all factual sure. accomplishments. Sure. So, and then after 30 days, you go for another 30 or what? After 30, I learned so much about what foods. So after the 30, you then reintroduce the stuff that you pull out. So kind of like a scientific experiment. But you, you, compare. you, but you and your, the person yeah. that you guys decided that we're yeah. going to, we're going to add it back. Yeah, you, you eliminate and then you add it back in. So I was okay. like, okay, I took out dairy and I took out sugar in my coffee and I took out this and I took out that. And then I brought it back in and was like, oh my gosh, that feels terrible. Like right. I, I felt so good during these 30 days. Right. It's not worth it to me to put sugar in my coffee anymore. And like the dairy doesn't actually do really well for my system. And it taught me so how let's say food... you took those first 30 days, you took 12 things out. Yeah. And you put all 12 back. One at a time, at a time. carefully and systematically. It and really is a self what did you What did you learn? What, what, what were the things that were just killers? Dairy killed me. And I was right. eating tons of like low fat cottage cheese at right. the time, but it was making my like stomach really upset. It was making my skin break out. And I never really associated that before. Right. I didn't do very well with sugar. So too much sugar, especially in combination with like, gluten. So, you know, muffins and sure, cupcakes sure. and cookies and stuff didn't work. Um, white rice still worked really well for me. Hummus still worked really well for me. Alcohol was like very rarely worth it at that point. So how long would like, let's say uh, day 31. Yeah. You put um, dairy back. Yeah. And you felt bad for day. It was like a day or two. It just made me feel really sluggish. I, you know, my digestion was off. So, I so, felt bloated. But then you stopped dairy for and then the next day you're put so the 33rd day you're putting in sugar? Yeah, you do one food group at a time, giving right. yourself a couple days in between food groups to reset back with like the Cleaner squeaky palette. clean. Yeah, with the whole 30, exactly. Cool. So, so now it's like 2007. You've had 30 clean days. You've been off drugs for a while. Yeah. And then you're like, I'm going to knock out a few books. So 2000, July 2009 was the start of the first group whole 30 where I wrote about it. And then right. we spent... Like I basically the next three years, just traveling from CrossFit gym to CrossFit gym, talking about the whole 30, leading people through the program, setting up a website, building a community. And the first book came in 2012. So 2009, the world is ending. So financial crisis. Um, I don't know if that's affecting you at all at that yeah, point. Yeah, I had a really good job for about 10 years working for an insurance company. So I was able to really like fund Whole30 for a while. Nice. Um, we were always profitable, which was great. We did realize really early on, though, that if our only product was workshops, if we weren't doing a workshop, we weren't getting paid. So right. generating some passive income became important at that point. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, the first book came out in 2012. And that was really like the... Were you a natural writer? I mean, I wrote a book and it's, it's, it was hard for me, but yeah. you sound you're yeah. smarter than me. So. I, no, I, I like writing. Right. And I've always been really good at writing. And writing has always been an outlet for me. Got it. Like I've always written. So yeah. Yeah. And New York Times, you crushed it. Yeah. The first book hit the New York Times list, not when it debuted, but a couple months later. And that was great. And we started getting some national media out of that, which was great. And then the flagship book, The Whole 30, was 2015. And that's when like it really, really exploded. Tight. Yeah. And and do you think, and all of that is like patting you on the back that that and, and kind of keeping you straight? Like, because there's always that risk, right? An addict always... <sighs> Yeah, my risk for relapse at this point is like basically zero, but I will never say zero because I feel like it's very important to me to continue to maintain those buffers. Yeah. But at this point, I'm so far removed. Like I have so much adoption into that growth mindset. I've really like reassigned my self-worth and my self-confidence. I've learned so many other ways to cope and I've processed my trauma effectively. So sure. the need to use to kind of numb that experience is just no longer there no no so what if you had to if somebody's out there and they're having a tough time whatever their their issue is somebody like me i got a, a, a sure. exercise addiction um a couple of simple things i think i'm, the, I'm not going to go to a therapist so what oh i like that right <laughs> off the bat so you know the i think the most important thing is to realize that like shame hides in the dark 
like shame or shame grows in the dark or thrives in the dark. And so speaking your trauma, whether it is to someone in a DM, maybe it's someone you look up to online, or maybe it's your close friend, or maybe it's just like one person or someone on, you know, a therapy app can be very, very powerful. Like just bringing it out into the light and you know acknowledging it. It's funny it. because you and I only met each other 10, 20 minutes yeah. ago and, um, and you came right out with it. Yeah. And it was not only powerful, probably for, it was powerful for me. Good. Like, like, um, all of a sudden it was like, she's pretty cool. Thanks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, cause it's hard. It would be hard. I, you would assume being the receiver of that information for somebody to come out with that. Yeah. I, the way I like to describe it is like, this is the floor. That's the sky. That's a camera. I was raped. Right. Like it's literally, I want to talk about it that matter of factly. This is what happened. It's not my big story about it. It's not what it means about me as a person. And hopefully in doing that with my voice, I can inspire other people to find theirs, whatever that looks like when the time is right for them. Sure. So um, what do you want to tell uh, people out there? Go to Whole30. How do you get to Whole30? Whole30.com is basically and like all the social media stuff is Whole30. Um, you know, the program is about food, but it's not really about food. It's about our emotional relationship with food and the way we talk about food in our bodies and the morality we've learned around food. And, and we really like are doing our best to dispel everything about diet culture. So we should do, um, I guess the Spartan version of Whole30 would be the Whole 3000. Yeah. <laughs> you got, you got I it. like it. That is a long time <laughs> a to long Whole30. Time. Hey, listen, <laughs> like, it's Spartan. And there would be like monkeys throwing ninja stars <laughs> exactly. as you're like exactly. doing the program. Yeah, exactly. I'm on it. I like it. <laughs> you're awesome. That was a lot of fun. Thank you Thank, so thanks much. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. Um, okay, great interview. Great concept, and I think it's it's helped a lot of people realize what their baseline is around nutrition and figure out some of the things that are triggering them. Yeah, and like you say, their baseline, right? Yeah. And, and the idea that there are so many diets, this diet out there and that diet out there, that are this is the one that's going to work. There's 8 billion people on the planet and, um, you know, many, many different types. So that, that's really yeah. powerful the way she personalizes it. Well, not, not personalizes it. She teaches how to self-experiment so that we really actually know what works for us. The, the biome of your gut flora, right? I mean, I can always talk about the flora found out on the natural often, landscape. Often comes up. Well, it does, really, because <laughs> your stomach is your first brain, right? And so everyone... Well, yeah, but, you know, your epigenetics, your ancestors, where you come from dictates a lot of what, like, the foods that you're predisposed to either. That, that's what we did. We did the DNA fit. The, DNA fit, the right. foods, The foods that you can either process well or you don't process well. And they're going to be so, different for different people. Of course. It's like, you know, a cactus doesn't grow in, you know. Maine. S- Miami. Well, maybe it does. Yeah, Maine. Maine. Let's talk about Maine. Maine. Yeah, Maine. I think one of the things, though, the that. lobster plant grows there. <laughs> one of the things that I think that you're talking about which I took from the interview a lot was that you really need to individualize your own treatment plan and you know as a psychologist and therapist when I work for my clients for example I might say to somebody like well tell me do you journal like that's my question not saying I think you need to journal no you all need to journal well but ask it you know so really like having the individual develop their own treatment plan because if they don't like journaling for one reason or another but going out you know and sitting by the river is going to give them the same meditative value that journaling might then they need to go sit by the river so I like that whole so I like that whole concept of like really finding your own path in your own treatment whatever that treatment is for and she's obviously we're talking about food and addiction and then the negative aspects right. obviously of addiction and so the the whole 30 is the therapy right but she talked deeper i mean she talked about her background totally. um and any abuse that she had gone through as a child and then talking about again that that you should never be ashamed of of receiving therapy or needing therapy the and that thrives in the, and the shame thrives in the shadows is exactly right. And so, so she's got the food, but you know, again, you can kind of extrapolate or expand out on that, uh, about the whole addiction therapy, the need for it. And again, uh, coming from a military background, there's a lot of guys out there who need therapy who should not be ashamed of asking for it or seeking it. Yeah. She, she talks about that. We need to normalize therapy. We need to take away the stigma that surrounds therapy. Um, you, you and I talked about that after one of our recent interviews that we're watching the idea that it's amazing how often this is coming up now it's, in our yeah. interviews. And, and too often. Well, too, too often in that it's, it's unfortunate it happens, but amazingly, wonderfully often in that people are talking about it. And I love when she said, that's the table, that's the chair, I was raped. I don't want right. it to be any different than that. Right. And I think wait, that, wait, when, I just want to clarify, when you're saying how often it's coming up, are you talking about sexual abuse or people going to therapy? Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Well, but sexual well, abuse, sexual abuse hand is hand. one that, that, it, right. that it's come up many, many times where our guests are telling us their, their stories. And of course. And it used to be you kept that story to yourself. And, you know, the idea that when you put it out there, when you're honest about it, when you shine a light on this thing that you used to hide, 
you can address it, you can powerfully address it and move forward. I also want to talk about when she t- um, was treating her, um, her addiction, and she talked about how that came out of this shame and out of everything else, and she went to rehab, and she said the first time the only thing she changed was that she stopped using drugs. And for a year she was successful, but she was almost guaranteed to relapse because everything else around her life was the same. Right. The second time she changed everything, changed absolutely everything. And she said, I now feel that I'm in such a low risk of relapse because I'm a completely different person. I have a completely different life. All those things that I used to run from that I was using drugs for, I'm just not using anymore. I I, I don't need that. So that was hugely powerful. Well, that goes back to something we've talked about before. And certainly I've talked about again, the whole resilience, right? The ability to bake or or, or bend without breaking or to bounce or to bounce back. Right. Yeah. But if you don't have the structure to begin with, there is nothing to bounce back too yep. so you need the structure or the integrity to begin with yeah and so that's what she didn't have originally and that's what she built the second time i think as well as an onion farmer right i think you peel back the layers of the onion you get down to what the core is right and when you're replanting those onions it doesn't just work in any soil if you want a successful garden you're gonna have to amend it to be able to make it thrive with whatever you're trying to go and you said in terms of <laughs> Thriving in the shadows. You want to know what else thrives in the shadows? Mushrooms. By Salas Peruviana, a golden berry. If you're watching or listening and not watching, this superfood, right? Ancient crop of the Incas, um, used to thrive everywhere as a great ground cover. And when you think about the whole 30 diet, when you're eliminating all of these things that, I don't bad, know, are real food. The processed foods, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. processed foods. It's like we have a way over 30,000 edible species of plants on this planet. We rely on about 20 of them. Oh. The other thing she talked about that I thought was great was the idea that when you are eating well, and she said when she actually started eating really well, removed all these bad things from her diet and was putting the good things in, she said she was blown away. She you know, thought maybe she'd lose some weight, maybe she'd feel a little better. She said suddenly like her acuity of thought was right. there, her performance was there, yeah. her recovery was there, her sleep was there. Everything was a thousand times better all of a sudden. And, um, and that really appeal to me it's the idea you know if, if somebody says oh man i lost 30 pounds well, i don't need to lose 30 pounds so it doesn't get me but man do i want to feel jacked every day do i want to walk around with energy and excitement yeah sure. yeah yep. one of the other things that i really liked about what she was saying was that she really used the parts of her the parts of her that fueled her addiction to like fuel her healing and this new entrance into that whole 30, that idea. And I've said this before on podcasts of using your poison and turning it into medicine. Like I think that all or nothing thinking that, that she had really actually began this whole thing, right? She was sitting there with the th- sleeve of thin mints and someone said, you know, her friend said, let's do this. And she was like, okay, I'm done and cut it off. So I think too, for, for the audience and I know for myself and for my clients, what I encourage a lot is for them to really look at like, okay, the, the parts of you that are fueling whatever is destroying you or not serving you anymore, how can you not eliminate those parts but just fuel that energy elsewhere into yeah. something more positive? But is that uh, – just quick, quickly, I know we're running out of time. Is it part of addictive personality though? Is those, that all or nothing, that swing? Yeah, I mean, I def- I mean, I think all all or nothing think individuals with you know are who are more prone to addictions absolutely have a greater swing. You know, they have a much more difficult time sort of being in the middle. Yeah. But I think we all have a touch of all or nothing. Oh, sure, you know, sure. So I, I, especially it, in this group. Yeah, well, it's it, no personally. I know that like I legitimately have um, an addiction to, to stimulation. I I am a I have to be hyper stimulated, and if I don't find good outlets for that, I'll find bad outlets for right, it. Right. So you have to recognize your personality yep. traits and 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 do that. I, I just want to mention one other thing with uh, with Melissa Hartwig Urban is that she um, she does have the book Whole30. Yeah. She has a couple of best selling books out there and so this isn't something that it's like oh believe me this is the greatest diet in the world. This is something that says go and apply what she's doing to your life and you'll actually find what works for you. That's, that's I just want right. to put that in there. No I like that. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by True Form Runner. Conquer your next race with a complete training solution from Spartan and True Form. The Spartan True Form Trainer will redefine your running, improve your form and reduce injury. Save 10% with the code SPARTAN10 at trueformrunner.com slash SPARTAN. That's trueformrunner.com slash SPARTAN. 